Good morning. Welcome to fall. When I got up this morning and went outside, it was 54 degrees, not quite what I was expecting. And I see uh, my weather app, uh, it's now balmy 57. So uh, uh, it kind of surprised me today. But thank you for coming to this Nordic semester presentation. It's my pleasure, it's always my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jim Lyle, professor of theater. This is Dr. Lyle's 15th year at Missouri Southern. And I think he has put on presentations related to the theme semester 12 or 13 of those 15 years. No matter what the country is, uh, he's got some sort of expertise in it. And Southern Theater always, almost always puts on a play from that country or region. And that's the case again this year. You see Dr. Lyle's uh, gorgeous t-shirt. Uh, they're performing Ghosts next week, October 3rd through, through 6th in, in the Black Box Theater, so make sure you go to that. Um, Dr. Lyle will be talking about the famous Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen today, who if, if you check out any list of the top 10 most famous Norwegians, Ibsen is always high on that list. Um, the other thing I appreciate about Dr. Lyle is whenever I have our, our guest speakers, uh, whenever I ask them to give me their uh, titles of their presentations, I always say, be creative. Uh, and you can see he's outdone himself again this year. Never wear your best trou trousers when you go out to fight for freedom and, and truth. So he's a creative genius and just all around good guy. Please welcome Dr. Jim Lyle. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Good morning, all. I'll explain the title when we get there, um, but thank you for coming. Yeah, it's always good for me to come into this auditorium because I got to town in Russia, and I've been here since then, so that's how I can always remember how long I've been here. <laughs> Henrik Ibsen is not only on a top ten list of famous Norwegians, he's on a top ten list of famous playwrights. In the history of the theater, he is one of the Hall of Famers, um, and rightly so, because he basically moves playwriting and with it, theatrical production and lots of different things into a kind of a new direction. And so I wanted to introduce you to him, and also as kind of a preface to the work that we're doing over in the theater department this semester with our production of Ghosts. I'm going to let you know that student Kaylee Baumhover designed the t-shirt, so before I forget later on. Uh, so just kind of representing today. Ghosts is one of Ibsen's most important, and uh, we'll, we'll share a little bit about that in just a minute. But first, a brief bit of biography um, for Mr. Ibsen. As you can see, he was born in 28 and died in 06, and lived a very full and busy life. The beginning of his life was very, very prosperous. His father was a successful businessman. The family had a bunch of money, and they were doing great in a little town called Skeen. And when Ibsen was seven years old, the bottom fell out. Some bad business decisions and other circumstances caused his family to go bankrupt. So they had to move from in town out onto the suburbs. And that really kind of colored the way Ibsen approached the world for the rest of his life. It was a difficult adjustment, um, wasn't a lot of fun, and so he basically was in a make-do kind of situation for quite a while. This is the only picture of him, I think, with anything remotely resembling a smile, by the way. So there he is. As a young man, we know that he went to work uh, attempting to be a pharmacist. And I was just noticing on our map over here, if you take a look, the pink country on the far side is Norway. And down at the bottom, the thick part, Oslo is here, Bergen is here, and Grimstad is here. So Ibsen was basically making a triangle. He was trying to be a pharmacist in Grimstad. And he was terribly unhappy and didn't like it. And he finally got work in Bergen as a theater manager. So one thing to remember about Ibsen is you can't really tell a lot about him from his photographs because he's just like he's not having a good day. Um, but he's actually a very well-rounded theater performer, artist. He was a manager, a director, a playwright, in addition to everything else. So from Grimstad, he decides to quit being a pharmacist, 
Um, and he goes to Bergen and he works for a while there as a playwright, as a playwright sort of peripherally. He's trying to make a go of the theater and he's trying to be a playwright and it's just very difficult for him. He can't quite get the success that he wishes that he had. But he does keep moving up in management circles. And so he gets to Christiania where he's able to make a living. That's Oslo now. Christiania is what it used to be called. He also got married. Susanna, his wife, uh, they married, you see, in, 19, in 1858, and she was a fine, fine partner for him because she wanted him to be a brilliant Norwegian writer just as much as he did. So she basically was kind of marketing director and working with him and all different kinds of things because he was his own literary agent after a while. This is after Ibsen had had one fling with a young woman years before, which had produced a young boy, um, and so we don't hear much about him, but Ibsen did arrange for the care of that guy um, for the rest of his life. So it kind of like, you know, some scholars don't even know if he told Susanna about it, <laughs> but he told somebody because I know. Um, <laughs> but he did take care of that child, and he had, had two or three children with Susanna as well. Now, I want to point out, there's a great translator of Ibsen whose name was Rolf Fjelda. And I got to meet Rolf once upon a time, um, and he's a, a fine fellow and a great translator. He makes the point that part of Ibsen's development involves the year 1848. 1848 is sometimes referred to as the spring of nations. Everything comes unglued in 1848. It's one of those great moments where everybody is revolting about something somewhere. It happens in Italy, it happens in France. Political upheaval all over the place. Austria, Prussia, you name it. Well, where's Ibsen? Ibsen's on the sideline up in Norway where nothing's going on. But he's seeing all of this. And Fjelda makes a point in his introduction to this, uh, this anthology. In 1848, Ibsen was a half-starved, overworked pharmacist's assistant, aspiring determinedly toward a university education. Physically tough and tireless, Immensely hardworking, irrepressibly and irreverent, irreverently humorous, he was well equipped and accustomed through his caricature drawings, his satiric verses, and sharp tongue conversation to ridicule the better class of citizens. The merchant oligarchy that ran the little shipping port of Grimstad, so similar to those first families of his birthplace, Skeen, who had excluded him coldly and completely after his father's bankruptcy 12 years before. Now this same favored class suddenly felt themselves in peril of their own fortunes and lives as the status quo disintegrated everywhere on the continent. So there is upheaval, there's change, and Ibsen becomes increasingly unhappy with Norway. He sees it as a backwater. He sees the people as very small-minded. He refers to their pocket-sized souls. He's just not that interested, because I think partly, too, he doesn't feel like they're appreciating his genius significantly. And so he moves. He and Susanna, in 1864, they pack up, and they go to Italy, and to Germany, and back to Italy, and back to Germany. Different places on the continent for the next 27 years. So it's remarkable to me that the greatest of the Norwegian playwrights wrote his best stuff when he wasn't even in Norway. He was in other places really disliking Norway. Just not too crazy about the place. And this is the statue of him in front of the theater in Oslo. Some of you may have heard of a rock band called the Beatles. The Beatles are interesting to me because you can watch the arc of their development as artists as you listen to their music. They start off being a high school hop rock and roll band and then move into their kind of psychedelic period and then they get into what I call their music with cellos time where they're really kind of doing some more serious sorts of stuff and kind of returning to some roots back toward the end. Ibsen has a similar arc in his work and I think it's important to share this with you. He begins as a romantic as was everybody else. Part of this 1848 upheaval was a return to our nationalist roots and therefore, a return to those stories and myths that make us who we are. So Germanic legends, Norse sagas, all of these things are coming back into currency. So Ibsen is writing plays about Vikings. And they're very romantic, and they're very florid, and they're very big and formal. And they're just not getting him very far. So 
in the middle part of his life, where we're going to be living this morning, is when he moves into that period that we call realism. He did not set out to invent realism. We'll try to make that point as we go along. But the realist period is his middle part, and then he becomes very symbolic and rather mystical toward the end of his career. Um, very odd plays. We almost did one this year, and I'm kind of like, eh, you know, everybody at the end of that one dies in an avalanche, and that might be tricky to do. Uh, so we just, we just didn't do that one. But they're much more symbolic and mystical toward the end, and it kind of marks his career as a person, as he's finding different ways to express. And at the end of the day, Ibsen is about talking about human beings. And so that's kind of what you want to hang on to as he is talking about them. So the first thing I want to talk about is there are three plays that sort of define this middle period, this realist kind of period. Some you may have heard of, some you may not have. One you will if you come to see us next week. But first, you need to know Georg Brandes. One of the points that I make in my theater history classes is this. You may be the greatest playwright on planet Earth, but if nobody's writing about you, if nobody's calling attention to your work, then you may very well go unnoticed for the rest of your life. So the interesting relationship between artists and critics is a pretty important one. Um, I can name a couple of movements in the theater that basically got started because of critics. And this is kind of one of them. Brandis was um, a Dane, and he was a critic and a writer and an author who saw the modernist period as it was dawning. And he was thinking particularly for Scandinavia, this is where we need to be. We need to not be writing these old things again. We're on the cusp of something fresh and new. And so he was advocating this modernist sort of movement. He was correspondent with Ibsen. They were friends. They wrote letters back and forth all the time. He was correspondent with everybody. Ibsen, Strindberg, all those guys. And he's like, we've got to be moving forward. We've got to be moving ahead. And so the influence of Georg Brandes cannot really be understated when it comes to Henry Gibson. Ibsen asked him for advice. Ibsen banged ideas off of him, different kinds of things. And so Brandes encouraging this modernist sort of ten, trend, trend, and Ibsen being disenchanted with the way things were going, sort of combined to move us toward where we are in this realist period at the end of the 19th century. All right? A doll's house, 1879. I would venture to say Ibsen's most famous play, but it's not necessarily his best play. It's awful good, but there are a couple I like better. But this is the watershed. This is the one that puts him on the map. All right? Briefly, a woman named Nora is in a perfectly conventional relationship. Her husband is a very successful, middle-class sort of guy in their community. But one thing and another... Nora comes to the conclusion that she is not being treated well, which is an interesting problem because she's being treated exactly like just to how every other woman in this period was being treated. But Nora has this kind of awakening. She's done something from her husband for her husband that was illegal. Uh, he finds out about it. He certainly doesn't appreciate it. Uh, and that's when she kind of sees who he is. And the big deal about Nora is she leaves home. At the end of the play, she leaves her husband and children to go out into the world and discover who she is. I call it the door slam heard round the world. It's a play that's on my bucket list, but until I audition doors and hear the right sound, I can't do it yet. That's about the last thing you hear in the play. Boom, she's gone. Or is she? <laughs> the, the reaction to this play um, by the way, this genius is back in New York this year. This is Janet McTeer. If you ever get a chance to see her do anything, run, don't walk. She's in a play where she plays Sarah Bernhardt playing Hamlet. I know. All right, so. Now, as we look at the statue of Ibsen outside the Ibsen Museum in Oslo, I will tell you, the reaction to A Doll's House was somewhat mixed. It's a good play, interesting play, terrific characters. But wait a minute, she what? She left her husband? The leading actress in Germany would not play the play the way Ibsen wrote it because she said, I wouldn't leave my children. So there's no way this character would, right? Ibsen wrote another ending, which he referred to as a barbaric violence, but he did it anyway because he would get a payday if they did his play. All right? The relationship between art and money is almost as interesting as that between artists and critics. 
He rewrote this ending to where Nora and Torvald, her husband, have their, their climactic conversation with each other. And before she can leave the room, he takes her by the hand and opens the door of the room where their children are sleeping. And she looks in and sees them and melts to the floor in contrition. The end. Well, they play that one, okay, because she doesn't leave. My other favorite is somebody postulated this missing fourth act where Nora has moved in with her friend Christine and in this fourth act scene, Torvald finds her and she says, have you forgiven me then? Yeah, and she goes back home, all right? A lot of people rebelled at this notion, okay? They're like, wait a minute, that's not the way this play was written and that's not what this play is about. The play has been taken as an attack on marriage. It's not. It's been taken as a feminist manifesto. It's not. It's Ibsen discussing human beings and their relationships with each other and how they can be healthy and how they cannot sometimes. So, A Doll's House. It's brilliant. Learn it, love it. If you take theater appreciation class, you're likely to read it. <laughs> um, Brandis has something to say about this play as well. Ibsen did not feel himself to be the son of a fatherland. Part of a whole, the leader of a group, a member of a community. He simply feels himself to be a gifted individual. And the one thing he really believes in and respects is personality. So you've got these marvelous personalities in this show that are simply talked about and discussed. It's fascinating. Ghosts, 1881. I'm going to try not to drop too many spoilers on you because I want you to, I want you to come and see it. Um, Ibsen was encouraged by the reaction to A Doll's House. With the new ending and without the new ending, it was being performed all around Europe. It finally got done in England. It finally got done in the United States. And so A Doll's House was catching fire. Um, Editions of the script were selling out. They were having to print new editions. And so that was doing well. So he felt emboldened to continue this kind of path. Well, we're talking about issues in society that can impact people. We're talking about what can happen when people are in sort of you know, corrosive relationships with each other. Let's do this. So he writes a play called Ghosts. Briefly, which is always hard for me, First, Ghosts is not a good translation of the name of this play. The word in Norwegian translates better to those who walk again or those who come back. Revenants, okay? Revenants, those who come back. Because something happened in the past of these characters and it comes back for one reason or the other. The the decisions and actions of the past have a very real effect on the lives of the characters that we meet. Mrs. Alving and her son Oswald, you can already tell this play probably doesn't end terribly happily, right? right. Um, I'll just tell you, you can go read it for yourself if you want to. What happens is, and what really got people upset with Ibsen on this play, is Oswald is the victim of hereditary syphilis. His father lived a life of... Um, a real kind of dissipation that nobody in the community knows that. But he contracted syphilis, gave it to his wife, and she passed it in vitro to Oswald. So he never really stood a chance. You see how that works? Um, and so what happens during the course of the play is we learn about this and we start to see the effects of what this, this dad, what he had done, begins to visit itself upon this family. Um, some brilliant writing, some gorgeous characters. Um, it is Ibsen's smallest play, as a matter of fact. There's only five people in it. He's usually got at least a crowd scene or something, or the neighbors come over or that kind of thing. But there's five people in a room in almost real time. Because we begin on the late evening of one day and we end in the morning of the next day. So it's all just right there together. Very concentrated, very, very beautiful stuff. So um, that's what goes on. There's uh, Kenneth Branagh and Judy Dench up there. Um, it is a play that does continue to attract performers. All right, the critical response, well, we'll get to Munch in a second. The critical response was like that. Ah! Okay, we'll just let Munch be up here then. 
The critical response was rabid. The play was referred to as an open drain, an undressed wound, a dirty deed done publicly. All right? How dare you? What are you talking about? What? And the critics just savaged this play. It was quite a while before a performance of it was ever accomplished. And the first performance of Ghosts, the premiere performance, was done in Chicago, Illinois, by a touring company of Danish actors who just decided, let's do this, all right? That's way before it was ever even done in Europe. But Ghosts was a co-celeb because everybody's like, how dare Ibsen talk? And Ibsen's like, wait a minute, you guys just bought a doll's house. What's your problem with this one? And he got really, really mad, okay? And so we'll talk about his response to that in just a second. But the critics didn't care for this one much at all. However, oh, I'll just do this real quick. Um, Edvard Munch, yes, the screen. There's a really cool exhibit of his work over in our gallery, even as we speak. So you might want to make that a stop as well. Munch, years later, fan of Ibsen, was asked to do set designs for, for ghosts. And knowing nothing about the theater, this is what he turned in. Uh, several, several paintings of scenes from ghosts. And so when you read the play, you can recognize who's who and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, this is Oswald and his mom, but the big window looking out on the, on the world. But Munch did several of these, and they still exist, and they're very lovely things. Um, very expressive of the play, the modernity of the play, and all of that kind of stuff. Now, Ibsen has some champions in this period. A doll's house and ghosts cause these modernists to come out and play. Brandis is not the only person writing about a new way of doing things. And so you've got a situation where people find ways to get this play performed, this one and others. One of these is George Bernard Shaw. Shaw is in England, and what you have to do, I remember this is kind of funny, because growing up in Texas, you couldn't drink beer on a Sunday, except over there. Well, why could you go drink beer over there? Well, that's not a bar. That's a private club. You're not paying a cover charge. You're buying a subscription, all right? And that's a whole other thing. And that's what they did. No, 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 no. This isn't a theater. This is a theater club. And you have to buy a subscription. And indeed, there were only ever about 70 or 80 people in the club who would come and see the place. But A Doll's House, Ghosts particularly, got done this way in England. In this country, we had Mrs. Fisk, Minnie Fisk, who was a real cutting-edge actress. She was on top of everything. She refused to do the alternate ending for A Doll's House. She particularly scored in a play called Hedda Gobbler, which is another of Ibsen's greats. But she was a champion over here. And then, me, in about 15 years, this is Georg II, who was the duke of a little neighborhood called Saxe-Meiningen. And what Georg did, I mean, learn him, love him. He will reward your, your interest. Georg had two things that you need for artistic success, money and peace. And so he was able to rehearse plays for months if he wanted to. He was very into attention to detail and realism. And he toured. So people like Shaw and Ibsen, and Stanislavski, and all these different theater people got to see their work and saw how unique and interesting and good it was. Well, Georg was a huge friend of Ibsen, invited him over so he could see his production of Ghosts and all those kinds of things, gave him medals, all kinds of things. But it's that, it's that influence, those cross currents. So you take what Ibsen is writing under Brandis's critical influence, you couple that with a more realistic, detail-oriented, human-sized acting that they're doing in Sax Meiningen, and you get a whole new thing. The old age of the overblown melodrama, the very formulaic, easy-listening kind of boulevard theaters in Paris are all passing away, one by one, as this new thing starts to roll. Okay? So these are some of Ibsen's champions here. Now, which brings me to another quote. Brandis says this about Ibsen and the modernists. Thus we see him, who, like nearly all the older living writers, at first stood waist deep in the Romantic period. I love that, very descriptive. 
waist deep in the Romantic period, work himself out of it and up from it, by degrees become more and more modern, and at last the most modern of the modern. This, I am convinced, is his imperishable glory and will give lasting life to his works. For the modern is not the ephemeral, but the flame of life itself, the vital spark, the soul of an age. That word ephemeral, that means something that's here and then gone, just very passing. But for Brandis, it is the modern that's going to remain and going to survive. Here is Ibsen's response to the critics of ghosts. He was such a workmanlike fellow, and he was so careful with his work that he would do a play every other year or so. I mean, it was like, it was his job. He would sit down, and he would write, and he would work. An enemy of the people follows ghosts within the next year. He was so annoyed at the response, again, those pocket-sized souls he was talking about, that he very quickly put together an, okay, take this kind of response to what they were doing. Now, I tell my students, and have on more than one occasion, this play is good if you're feeling just fine, but you really would like to be aggravated and angry. If you're feeling a need for that, read this play. Okay? Many of you will recognize this play because there's a whole lot of it in a movie called Jaws. All right? <laughs> you have Dr. Stockman who is the officer in charge of the health of a mineral bath operation in their community. People would go and they would bathe in the, in the mineral waters, the, the warm waters, they would drink the waters, they were medicinal. People felt you know, better for having been there. This is this community's single industry. What happens is the plumbing is from the Roman period and it's begun to erode and decay and Dr. Stockman realizes that the thing is polluted. We run a risk of getting people sick. We have to close down and fix it. What do you mean close the beaches? There's no sharks out there, okay? That's what the mayor of Amity says. We can't do that. Meanwhile, the doctor's brother, as played by John Boy Walton up there in a recent American revival, is the mayor of the town. These two brothers now. You have to close the spa or people will get sick. Are you nuts? That's how we make the money for the rest of the year. But people are going to get sick. I don't care. And so you have a debate in the town hall, which turns into riots. And the enemy of the people is the doctor, who wants to preserve the health of their operation. Because as soon as people come and as soon as people get sick, that's going to shut them down anyway, right? Well, that's a risk we'll take, blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's the beautiful irony of that title. And Ibsen is directly addressing his critics. You don't know what's good for you. You're attacking me when I'm trying to help you. Okay? This is Hugh Bonneville. Some of you know him as the guy who lives at Downton Abbey. There you go. <laughs> That's him. And the biggest surprise of my life, dear hearts, I can share with you right now. This, some of you will know him and many of you will not. This is Steve McQueen. No motorcycles, no car chases. Steve McQueen. And his entire career was worth that performance. It's really very good. It's a film. It's a film version, and it's awfully, awfully fine. But you see, an enemy of the people is terribly realistic. What happens when these interests collide? What do we do with this? Because you notice from what I just told you now, it ceases to be business and becomes very personal very rapidly. And so then we start attacking humans instead of trying to figure out how to solve our problem. And that's basically what Ibsen's talking about with this play. He says, he was asked about this, and he quotes his friend Bjornsson. Bjornstern Bjornsson was another author in Norway. Ibsen says, Bjornsson says the majority is always right. And as a practical politician, he is bound, I suppose, to say so. I, on the contrary, must of necessity say the minority is always right. Naturally, I'm not thinking of that minority of stagnationists who are left behind by the great middle party, which with us is called liberal, but I mean that minority which leads the van and pushes on to points which the majority has not yet reached. He puts this sentiment 
in Dr. Stockman's mouth. The majority is never right. I say never. That's one of those social lies that any free man who thinks for himself has to rebel against. Who makes up the majority in any country, the intelligent or the stupid? I think we've got to agree that all over this whole wide earth, the stupid are in a fearsomely overpowering majority. But I'll be damned to perdition if it's part of the eternal plan that the stupid are meant to rule the intelligent. Dr. Stock, lay in. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Ibsen suspended his routine, basically, and just rattled this dude out really, really rapidly because he was so angry um, at the way his, his play had been responded to and treated. Isn't that great? This is the statue of Ibsen at Bergen, okay, which I think is marvelously evocative. Um, there are more. Uh, I, I would commend to your study the Master Builder and Hedda Gobbler and plays like that um, for his realist stuff. But these three plays, A Doll's House Really Breaks the Ice, Ghosts Tests the Fence, and An Enemy of the People Shows He Means It. He's committed to what Brandis was talking about. He's committed to this modernist idea to try and, and have people think about things a different way. All right? His last years, he moved back to Norway, and he lived in Oslo. And what makes me saddest is he had a series of strokes which gradually just debilitated him until he couldn't work anymore. Um, he was still able to walk for a while, but finally just became increasingly bedridden. And people would come and visit and hang around and, and all of that kind of thing. But leave it to Ibsen to have the very best curtain line. Because a group of them were hanging around one day. He was in bed behind them and they're looking out the window and they're discussing his condition. And the nurse watching him comes up to the group and says, well, I believe he's doing a little better. And from behind them they hear, Dvertemats which is Norwegian for, on the contrary. <laughs> and that was the last thing he ever said, <laughs> because the next day he passed away. All right. I think he's doing better. Um, no. All right, and then he died. Um, I want to uh, end with a couple of moments here. Um, one is to invite you uh, to come and see Ghosts. We open next Wednesday. Uh, it really is a beautiful little play, fascinating characters, lots of interesting issues. It will probably raise a few more questions than it answers, which is kind of what modernists do. Uh, and Ibsen will do that. And I hasten to tell you, it's one of those decisions you have to make for yourself, but these are not plays about Norwegians. There's a Norwegian context, there's a Norwegian mindset, but many of these people still exist. Uh, many of these issues are still floating around. And Ibsen just gives us a really good kind of way to dissect these things and, and look at them in a really, he's pretty fair uh, for the most part, but you can look at different sides of an issue. So do come and see us if at all possible. And I would like to end with a quote from Henry Gibson himself. One of my favorite pictures of him, by the way. Because it sums up how he felt about playwriting and I think it really encapsulates how we respond and relate to art. He was invited to speak to the Norwegian Women's Rights League because they thought he was a feminist. <laughs> Look at that play you wrote. Yay! So be a feminist and come speak to us. May 26, 1898. He says, I am not a member of the Women's Rights League. Whatever I have written has been without any conscious thought of making propaganda. I have been more poet and less social philosopher than people generally seem inclined to believe. I thank you for the toast, but must disclaim the honor of having consciously worked for the women's rights movement. I am not even quite clear as to just what this women's rights movement really is. To me, it has seemed a problem of humanity in general. And if you read my books carefully, you will understand this. True enough, it is desirable to solve the problem of women's rights, along with all the others. But that has not been the whole purpose. My task has been the description of humanity. To be sure, whenever such a description is felt to be reasonably true, the reader will insert his own feelings and sentiments into the work of the poet. These are attributed to the poet. 
but incorrectly so. Every reader remolds it so beautifully and nicely, each according to his own personality. Not only those who write, but also those who read are poets. They are collaborators. They are often more poetical than the poet himself. I thank you. And we've got a couple of minutes if there are any questions. Yes. I can, I can. I think um, as much as he might disclaim it, um, the idea of the individual, the idea of the flowering of the individual as it relates you know, necessarily to democracy and you know, those kinds of things, I think that's in there. But I think he would say that it's not about, it's not about overthrowing monarchical frameworks, it's not about establishments of democracies, it's more about the realization of the individual's personality within that. But yeah, I think it's, I think it's a thread all the way through. What else can I do for you? I thank you for coming. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. 7.30 in the Bud Walton Theater, which is right across the parking lot from here. And tickets are available at the door, if you like. Yes, sir. Of all this place, how did you happen to choose ghosts? You know, as opposed to an enemy of the people or whatever. It made such a splash when it opened, and it was such a controversial play uh, at the time, and plus it's a, a manageable sized cast. An enemy of the people takes about 40 people. Because <laughs> you have to have crowds and rioting and rock throwing and all kinds of terrible things. But Ghost is just five people, and it's just such a beautiful little contained thing. Um, and when we did awaken, there's not a large cast either, but you got that avalanche you got to figure out. So I just spared myself that one. Um, you just explained, but what about the Dolphin House? Because we learned about it from Peter Appreciation, and you always talk about how much you love it. <laughs> yeah, and I think for that reason, my, my, actually my deliberate thought was, we've got a Dolls House in class, well, let's have another one. So we've got two Ibsens that we can kind of be banging around this semester as well. By the way, if anyone's interested, I think his finest play is one called The Wild Duck. So if you ever get a chance, go take a look at that one too. I can't talk about it because it breaks my heart. So we just want to deal with it. Yes. Tickets are $5 for students, $8 for other human beings, $7 for other human beings. All right, my dears, thank you for coming. Appreciate it.